Hello and welcome. Now, a few months ago, I made a video in which I talked through everything you need to know to get started with Kalkwasa and how to dose Kalkwasa in a saltwater aquarium. In that video, I promised I'd do a follow-up video uh, telling you all of the other things you need to know, loads of little extra, really useful bits of information, and that's what this video is. So today, I've got 20 things to talk you through, and make sure you stick around to the very end of the video, because I'll be running through the most frequently asked questions on my previous videos and on the posts that I put up before this video, and there are some really interesting questions there that raise some really good points that you need to know the answers to. So let's get stuck into it without further ado. Uh, so first thing you need to know is that this is my aquarium. So this is the tank that uh, I'm talking about when I'm running Calquasa. I'm actually running it on another tank as well, but this is the main one. Uh, it's an SPS dominated tank, of course, um, and it's doing very well. That's basically what it looks like. You can pause the video and go back to that if you want to see what it goes like. And I've done loads of other videos where I've talked through how my tank goes. So number one on the list then, the first thing I need to tell you about, and this was the question that came up more than any other question around pH. How do you increase, so the question is, how do you use Calquasa to increase your pH without dangerously increasing your alkalinity? And the reason I'm leading with this is because I think it's a misunderstanding of the way Calquasa works. If you're using Calquasa with the sole intention of increasing pH, that's dangerous if you're going to be ignoring your alkalinity and calcium. So Calquasa is actually a supplement to replace alkalinity and calcium. And as a side benefit, it will also increase your pH. And that is the way to look at it. If you just dose it trying to pin your pH at a certain level and ignore your alkalinity and your calcium, that's going to go up and up and up uh, to a dangerously high level. Uh, and this is, I think, based on the, the Chris Meckley method from ACI Aquaculture. That is what he does. But he also does say that you shouldn't be doing it his way. because It's a very sophisticated way. He uses some serious chemicals beyond Calquasa. Um, and he has years of experience and tons of monitoring equipment, staff on hand, all these sorts of things. It's not intended for the home aquarium. Uh, and the way to look at it is, uh, is Calquasa is kind of like nitrous oxide at the dentist. Nitrous oxide is given to you when you go to the dentist to numb the pain and make, uh, make it possible to do operations pulling out your teeth and so on. As a side effect, it makes you giggly and, uh, and laugh and chuckle away um, in the car on the way home. But if you're using nitrous oxide just to get that boost, that high, and make you giggly and say funny things, that's really dangerous. And actually, it's very, very easy to overdose it in that situation. And people end up with nasty injuries and even sometimes dying. So it's the exact same thing with Calquasa. If you use it for the right purpose, calcium and alkalinity with a side boost of pH, it will give you that little benefit. But if you're just using it to pick your pH as high as you can, and you think, I don't care what happens to the alkalinity, you're asking for trouble. There will be times when you just start with a small tank with not many corals in it, uh, and you're, you're not using a lot of uh, Calquasa, and that means that it's not raising your pH very much. And the only real way to get around that is to add more Calquasa. But if, you're, if you can't add more because it will boost your alkalinity too high, all you need to do is wait, add more corals very slowly, don't add more corals too quickly. And then when you've got more corals, you'll be able to increase your dose because corals will uptake al alkalinity and calcium. So the most important thing uh, to take away from this video is that one point. Number two, and this was another tip I talked about um, briefly in the first video, and that is measure evaporation of your tank before you start dosing Calquasa. Now, Calquasa is effectively a freshwater solution, and so it replaces the water that you lose to evaporation in fresh water each day. Uh, and therefore, you're, you've got a limit. On my tank, for example, I lose between 3.2 and 4.2 litres per day of uh, fresh water. That varies throughout the year. Uh, but what I do is if you if I were to then say, well, I lose 4.2 at the max. So I dose 4.2 litres of Calquasa. Then that gives me the problem that if my uh, evaporation drops from day to day or even month to month, then I'm dosing too much water. The fresh water will eventually fill your sump up and overflow. So you don't want to risk that. You'll probably catch it and see it one day, but you don't want to risk that. So what I do instead, my minimum evaporation that I lose is 3.2 litres per day. That's the minimum all year round. So I dose 
three liters per day, which means I'm never going to put more fresh water in my system uh, than I need to. So that's the first reason that you should uh, you should measure your evaporation on your tank before you start dosing Kalkwasser. The second reason is that you will then know what uh, container size to buy. Uh, if you've got if you lose one liter of Kalkwasser per day, you know that then a 14 liter Kalkwasser container will last you 14 days, and therefore you'll be able to refill it every two weeks. Or you might want to get a 28 liter container to last you the full month. Number three. Uh, and this is that uh, evaporation fluctuates. In fact, I've just talked about that, so we'll combine those together. So that's, you know all that about uh, Kalkwasser uh, evaporating and fluctuating, sorry, freshwater fluctuating. Uh, the next one, number three, uh, and this is why not mix, and this was, a, again, a really common question that came up, uh, and it was why not mix uh, Kalkwasser with tap water instead of RODI water or even salt water? And the answer to that, well, there are a couple of reasons you don't want to. Firstly, if you're doing it with tap water, you don't really want to be putting tap water in your tank anyway. There are all sorts of things in there that you probably shouldn't be putting in your tank. So far, far better to always use zero TDS RODI water. But also the capacity for tap water to hold Kalkwasser is less than the capacity of RODI water. So you can fit about 1.5 grams of Kalkwasser in a liter of RODI water. Uh, but if there is other stuff dissolved in that water, there's less space for the Kalkwasser to dissolve. So the Kalkwasser, uh, so the capacity is much, much lower and it will depend on what's in your water, but it can be up to half. So you really want to be able to maximize the amount of Kalkwasser you can mix in. That's why you should use RODI water. Uh, and why shouldn't you mix it with uh, with salt water? Well, quite simply, partly for the same reason, because there's salt dissolved, so it won't do it again. But also, if you're adding salt water in, that's replacing the fresh water that evaporates. So your tank salinity is going to increase and it's going to wipe everything out in your tank. You should never, of course, replace evaporated water with salt water, only ever fresh water. So that's the main reason, apart from a number of other reasons, but that's the main reason you shouldn't uh, mix Kalkwasser with salt water. All right. Number four is that uh, Kalkwasser replaces your ATO in part, which means that you will lose less water from your freshwater reservoir container than you would do otherwise. And this is really useful. On my, on my tank, my freshwater container for my auto top-off holds about 100 litres of water. Now that used to last, I don't know, two weeks, something like that. It now lasts months on end because I hardly use my auto top off, hardly ever kicks in because I'm adding fresh water through my Kalkwasser constantly throughout the day. This is really useful though if you've got something like a Red Sea Reefer with the inbuilt freshwater reservoir. Those things tend to last about three days before you need to fill them up again, which I've always found to be a real pain in the backside. So if, you've, if you're using Kalkwasser, suddenly you won't have to be topping up your freshwater reservoir so often. And when you get to the point where you're at 90% of your evaporation replaced by Kalkwasser, your auto top off reservoir will last for ages. So, a really nice little benefit there. Uh, number five, do not put Kalkwasser in your auto top off. So, this was a, a, a kind of this was the, the way that this was done back in the day when Kalkwasser was really popular. And there are still some people who do it now, is because you, uh, your auto top off already replaces fresh water into your aquarium, why not just put the Kalkwasser in there and let it dose the Kalkwasser into your tank? But there are a number of reasons. For a start, we've already established that uh, your evaporation fluctuates throughout the day. And that means that some days and throughout, it's not just day to day, but it's also month to month and season to season, the, the evaporation difference is quite significant. It can be sort of 20% or so. Um, so you don't have that, if you're just putting it in your auto top off, that means the amount of calcium and alkalinity that you add to your tank is going to vary day to day and you don't want that but also it doesn't give you any control you have no control over how much you put in whereas if you put a separate container with fresh water mixed with uh, uh with uh, calcrasser you can just put it on a dosing pump dose the calcrasser solution into your tank and you can tell it to dose 100 milliliters a day a liter a day whatever you want and it will always be exactly the same also if you're putting uh, your ato if you're putting calcrasser in your ato Kalkwasser can be quite caustic with pumps. And if there's a pump sitting in it 24 seven, it's gonna uh, pretty much go kaput a lot sooner than it would otherwise. So you really don't wanna be doing that because you'll just be going through auto top off pumps like there's no tomorrow. Uh, so because it ruins pumps then, 
Does that mean you should be concerned about it ruining your own pumps, your return pumps, and those sorts of things in your main tank? Well, that takes us on to number six. And for number six, I'm going to show you my uh, my sump. So the first thing to say with this is this is what my uh, this is the, this is where my calc cluster goes in. So it's on the left hand side, and I'll pause the video there. On the left hand side is where the calc cluster goes in, and you can see. I get a bit of splash back and it encrusts on the edge here. Whereas on the right hand side, that's just normal part of the sump and it's completely clear. So actually uh, it does encrust when it splashes uh, away. And this is a better angle actually from the inside. So you can see kind of flakes building up uh, and you can really see it does certainly build up a level of crusty badness. Um, however, it's not necessarily something you should worry about ruining your pumps. That section is my return pump section. So I have two Jekod cheap Chinese return pumps sitting in there and they are still working perfectly fine 11 months, 10 months down the line after I started dosing Kalkwasser. With that being said, there are plenty of people out there who will report that their return pumps seize up over time from dripping and from living close to uh, to a Kalkwasser source. So it is very much true that it will make, it will cause some kind of wear and tear on your pumps, and it probably isn't a bad idea to clean them, maybe every six months, which we should probably be doing anyway, uh, and certainly every year. And it is something to watch out for, but it's not like it's going to ruin your pump straight away, and that fancy, shiny Ecotech Vectra you've just put in is going to be ruined overnight. It's not something necessary to worry about, but it is something to keep an eye on. And it is something that's worth thinking about. So that takes us on to number seven. Uh, and this is that you should be using it with a, uh, a dosing pump. So in terms of dosing pumps, one of the other questions I got asked about quite often was uh, which dosing pump is best. There's probably no such thing as best equipment with anything. Uh, and that includes dosing pumps for Calcrusser. But in terms of the dosing pump I use, I use an Ecotech Vectra, which is a perfectly good pump and does a perfectly good job. So this is it. This is it on my second tank, my water box. You can see how slowly it turns, really slowly as it drips tiny little amounts in uh, second by second. So that is the, the, the dosing pump I use. But that doesn't necessarily mean it should be the one you use. There are others that, uh, that do a perfectly good job as well. The Kamoa FXTP uh, and a few others. Really, you want a continuous duty dosing pump because that means it's capable of running all day long without overheating, uh, and it, that's what it's designed to do. Not all dosing pumps are continuous duty, which is why I've used the Ecotech Versa, but there are others as well that do it, and I think the uh, Neptune Dose is really popular for that application. I really like the uh, Ecotech Versa. The only thing I don't like is that it, it does know how much uh, liquid is in your calc cluster container, but when your calc container runs out, it doesn't send you a notification to tell you that you need to fill it up. Apart from that, it's really good. But basically, do a search for a continuous, do continuous duty dosing pump and you're laughing. All right, following on from that as well is number eight. Uh, and this is that you should have the inlet of the uh, in the uh, that sits in your Kalkwasser container, slightly off the bottom of the uh, the container. So normally, if you're dosing two part solutions, if this is the bottom of your dosing container, most people will put the and this is the inline. This is the tube that takes the the dosing liquids to your tank. Most people will put the tube right at the very bottom, which means that it will suck up the very last dregs of the uh, of the dosing liquids. And that means you won't have to top it up uh, quite as often as you would do if it was off the, off the bottom. But with Calcwasser, any excess Calcwasser that hasn't dissolved, so beyond 1.5 grams per litre, will settle out at the bottom and will form a sludge. And that is a sludge you do not want to be adding to your tank. It's a higher concentration pH. And in theory, things, any pollutants that are in Calcwasser, I haven't found any, but any pollutants that are in Calcwasser are likely to settle out there as a theory. So you want to make sure the inlet uh, of your dosing tube is just slightly off the bottom of the container. I have mine about an inch off the bottom and that's absolutely fine. Uh, and also oh, settle, let it settle before you uh, you use it. So when you mix up Calcwasser, you just stir it for 30 seconds or so. You don't have to stir it like crazy. You don't need to use uh, a power head. Just let it settle for half an hour to an hour before you start dosing it to your tank because it's a little bit more concentrated than there are particles in the water um, of, of calc that will settle out at the bottom after about half an hour or so. It's not the end of the world if you don't do that. 
And don't panic if that's what you've done, but it's always best practice to give it a bit of time to settle. Number 10. So that's the way I dose um, Calquasa, just from a container through a dosing pump that pours it straight in. But the other most popular way of dosing Calquasa is to use a calc stirrer. Now, a calc stirrer is effectively uh, a cylinder that sits in your tank, uh, either in your sump or in your cabinet, uh, and you fill it with uh, water, fresh water. So it'll be, hold about two liters, say. You fill it with fresh water and an absolute ton of Calquasa. So normally two liters of water will hold three grams of Calquasa. But what you do is you put, uh, say, 100 grams into the calc stirrer and any excess beyond the three uh, three grams you'll uh, that will uh, uh, evaporate, sorry, that will uh, that will soak up into the uh, the calc cluster and become saturated. Any excess beyond that, beyond that, the 97 grams will just sit at the bottom. The calc stirrer then has a stir bar that stirs very gently to make sure that the the, the dust particles, the calc cluster, doesn't go up too high. It stirs it very very gently, but it does keep it uh, just about moving. Then you use a dosing pump to feed fresh water from your fresh water reservoir into the bottom of the calc stirrer. It then pushes water up and pushes nice yummy calc wasser mix out of the top. And as that new fresh water comes in, of course, it dilutes the existing calc wasser solution. But because it's constantly stirring and constantly mixing up the undissolved calc wasser at the bottom, it then reinvigorates it and pushes it back up to maximum saturation. So that's what a calc wasser stir is. A very rough guide. They're quite expensive, but they are very good and they're space saving. Uh, and that is the, uh, the key thing. That moves us on to number 11 then. And this is whether you need to stir periodically. The theory being that if you don't stir periodically, uh, will you lose potency? Well, Yes and no. The simple answer that I follow is that you don't need to worry about that and it's not going to have a significant impact. If you look at the science behind it, and there are articles on Reef to Reef from Randy Holmes Farley, it does lose some potency after a time and you'll get varying reports on whether that's after two weeks, three weeks, four weeks, months, whatever. In my experience, I don't really mind. I have a container that uses a month's uh, calc at a time and I've never found any effect on the tank. I don't test the calcuasa for potency, but I've never found any difference to the tank uh, from day one to day 28. So it's probably not something you need to worry about. But if you are a little bit concerned and you don't want it to lose any potency whatsoever, i.e. for your pH to drop a tiny little bit in the calcuasa solution, and you want to get the absolute maximum benefit, then just change the container every two weeks and you will be absolutely fine. And it will almost always be absolute max saturation, max potency. Okay, so that moves us on to number 12. And this is a don't do. This one thing you should never do is add calcwasser powder direct to your tank. It's absolutely essential that you don't do that. If you do, because it's such a high pH and such a caustic solution, it will cause a massive spike in pH to your tank obviously depending on how much you add if you just put a tiny bit in nothing's going to happen but if you chucked in 100 grams into even a sort of 500 gallon tank that is going to have a significant impact and there's every chance that you'll wipe out your corals i don't see people doing that very often i don't think it's a common thing but it's just really important if you're ever tempted to just say i can't be bothered to mix it up i'll just put in a little bit this one time just to bump my alkalinity up or my ph up a bit do not do it. It is a disaster waiting to happen. The instructions are really clear on that, but just make sure you don't do it. Number 13 then, and this is about potency. So I talked about potency potentially losing, uh, dropping down a little bit over time. Not something you need to worry about in my opinion, uh, but the potency, the pH potency of saturated, fully saturated calcwasser is 12.4. Now in a reef tank, saltwater aquarium, you want to aim for a pH of, well, and when I say aim for, a healthy pH is somewhere between eight and 8.3, somewhere in that kind of ballpark. The ocean sits at, I think, between 8.2 and 8.3, and depending on where you are in the world. So that is kind of 8.3 is the magic figure that, uh, that you want to aim for. But the reality is that it does swing uh, from day to day. So you're never going to get it to sit at 8.3 all day long. But this is another thing because the pH potency is so high, that's what gives you the pH boost in this. But because it's so high, that also means that if you were to dump 10 litres of the stuff into your tank all at once, again, that would be a real problem. It would give you a massive pH spike and corals 
really don't like massive pH spikes. And you can see people having wipeouts from that. Now, in theory, that should mean that if you if your doser gets stuck on and doses an absolute ton of uh, calcwasser into your tank, that is a problem as well. It's not something I've ever seen happen. So it's not something that I think is a risk worth mentioning uh, or worth worrying about. But I do think it's worth mentioning. So that moves us on to number 14. And this is what level of pH you should aim for. And the answer here is that higher pH is not necessarily a good thing. So 8.3 is great. 8.4 is cool, but nine is bad. It's like alcohol. You know, some people might say with pH, hey, a little is good, more must be better. But that's not the case. If you go on a date and you have a little bit of alcohol, give you a bit of confidence maybe, uh, and you might be a bit funnier and a bit more relaxed and uh, a bit more confident than you would be otherwise. But if you have 10 pints on that date, you're not going to be quite so amusing and you're never going to see the date again. Same with Calquasa. Sorry, same with pH. 8.3 is great. And if you can get it to that kind of level, you're laughing. Much higher is dangerous and can start to cause real problems in your tank. I've never been able to find anyone to commit to what the tipping point is. So i.e., for example, 8.8 .8 is the absolute most. You shouldn't ever go higher or 9 or 8.6 or whatever. But personally, you don't really, I don't think you really want to be pushing it much beyond 8.3. If you get to sort of 8.6, you might kind of be okay with it. I'm personally okay with that, but make sure you do your own research on that. Uh, but you don't want to be pushing it really high. And if it's sitting at nine or above, you want to be checking your pH probe and making sure you're not uh, pushing your uh, pH too high. Number 15. And this is about the uh, logarithmic scale. So pH is on a logarithmic scale. So the difference between logarithmic and linear, of course, is money, for example, is measured on a linear scale. $9 is good. $10 is slightly better. And you'd be slightly happier with $10. However, with pH, uh, in fact, maybe it's better to go with 7 and 8. 7 pH is uh, very low. 8 pH might not sound like much of a bump, only $1 difference. But 8 pH, 8, a pH of 8 is 10 times more ph -ier, 10 times more basic than a pH of 7. So if you're therefore getting small bumps in your, uh, in your pH and you were sitting at, say, a pH of 8 before you started dosing Calcwasser and after you're up to 8.1, might not sound like a lot, but actually it is a significant difference. So even those tiny little boosts can give you a real benefit. Number 16, uh, and this is about magnesium and trace elements. So this is something that Calquasa doesn't do. I've listed all the things of, that Calquasa does do, and I've told you why it's so good, and it really is good stuff. Uh, but there are a couple of things it doesn't do. First off, it just replaces alkalinity and cal calcium. It doesn't replace the third major element, magnesium, that most people try to add, or pretty much everyone tries to add in their aquariums. So does that mean then that uh, you need to supplement magnesium separately? And the answer I found is mm, you might need to look out for it, but not necessarily. Actual uptake of magnesium in a reef tank in most saltwater aquariums isn't that high. Uh, and what I found in my main tank, I'm actually also dosing two-part solution, and that is on top of the Calquasa, and that is probably taking care of my magnesium. And actually, I'll share my magnesium levels, so I'm not just telling you uh, stories that you can't believe, and I'll share with you my most recent ICP test. Let's do that now. Yep. This is my most recent ICP test, and you can see my magnesium levels on my main tank were 13.23, so certainly not too high, uh, certainly not too low uh, for my personal preferences anyway. Absolutely fine. And that means that the dosing two part is probably taking care of that. However, there was also, I did another test a few months ago on my water box aquarium. This is my water box aquarium. And on that tank, uh, I am just dosing Calquasa, nothing else whatsoever, just Calquasa, no two part, no magnesium, no trace elements, nothing else, no calc, uh, calc, calc stirrer, uh, no calc reactor, sorry, just Calquasa. And my magnesium on that tank is 1260, which is, again, totally fine and well within a range of acceptable parameters. So do you need to dose the Calcwasa? Do you need to dose magnesium as well as Calcwasa? Well, it won't add magnesium to your tank. So it's absolutely something you need to keep an eye on. Probably something you should be testing once a month or so, which we should all probably be doing anyway. But it doesn't necessarily mean you're going to be chucking in an absolute ton 
of magnesium. There will be other people out there who have different experiences. All tanks are slightly different. So you might find that some people say they do supplement quite regularly. I found that I haven't needed to do that regularly. I also do water changes on that water box. Uh, but it is certainly something you need to keep an eye on, but not something that you necessarily need to worry about. And the second thing that, uh, that Calcwasa doesn't do is trace elements. And that's another really common question I got asked is what do you do about trace elements if you're not dosing them and you're just dosing Calcwasa? So in some two-part solutions, it will add trace elements. So in my main tank, I add trace elements through the two-part dosing that I do and also partly, very small amount, through 10% water changes every week. Um, on the water box, though, I do do 10% weekly water changes most of the time anyway. Sometimes I forget, don't tell anyone. Uh, but I don't add any, uh, any dosing solutions, so there's no trace elements. And I'm going to show you again. I'm going to go back to my um, uh, my, uh, my my ICP test, and this is the one for the water box. And what I'm going to show you is the recommendations for dosing. So this is what it tells me is low in my aquarium and needs adding, uh, and that is so. It's telling me bromine is low, strontium, boron, iodine, nickel, and zinc. Now nickel and zinc being low, I'm I'm all right with. Iodine is low in pretty much every tank in the entire world. I wouldn't mind betting. And the other things, boron, strontium, and bromine, are fairly standard. And actually, there's only six things on there that are low, and that is pretty common across many tanks. Uh, and there's nothing that's mega mega low, with the exception of nickel and zinc, I suppose. But basically, what I'm really saying is that, in my experience, anyway. You don't necessarily have to worry about trace elements in the same way you don't have to worry about uh, uh, magnesium, but you should keep an eye on it. And it isn't, doesn't hurt to do occasional ICP tests. And personally, what I would do is do an occasional ICP test, maybe once every month or once every three months, once every quarter. And then if you're low on, on trace elements, you can dose them as well. But ultimately, if you feel like you want to benefit, you benefit from trace elements, do your research, look into it and give it uh, some proper consideration. And I wouldn't necessarily say shouldn't, you shouldn't do it. It's just that I personally wouldn't do it. But ultimately, although trace elements aren't included in Calcwasa, the main point I'm trying to make is that it's not necessarily the end of the world and it's not necessarily a particularly important factor. Number 17, uh, and we have three left now before we get to the uh, the FAQs. Number 17 is that overnight uh, is dosing when to dose uh, uh, Calquasa. So actually, for most people, I think you should just dose it over a 24-hour period. Now, with normal two-part dosing, you would dose in, say, if you were going to dose over 24 hours, you would dose 24 lots, so maybe 10 milliliters every hour for 24 hours. With Calcwasa, because it's such a high pH solution, you want it to be nice and smooth, which is why you want a continuous duty dosing pump. So that means you want it to dose constantly to drip very, very slowly throughout a 24 hour period. That's the best way to do it for most people. And when I've done it over a 24 hour period, I found that my alkalinity is more stable. The other way to do it is to dose it overnight instead of 24 hours, so 12 hours for, uh, for the sake of argument. And the theory with that is that your pH is lower at night in your tank uh, than it is during the day, because during the day, corals are photosynthesizing, sucking up all the uh, the CO2, and that means that your pH is, uh, is not suppressed. Whereas overnight, all your lights go off, there's no photosynthesis going on, and you've just got corals, uh, sorry, fish breathing out CO2, uh, which brings your pH down. So the theory is that if you dose Calcwasa overnight, that will stable off your pH. And I have found that it does do that. It never flatlines it completely, uh, but it will probably be a flatter curve than if you dose it over 24 hours. But the flip side of that, the trade-off, nothing's perfect in life, is it? The flip side of that and the trade-off is that your alkalinity will be a little bit more up and down because you're dosing uh, uh, overnight rather than over a full 24 hour period. And alkalinity consumption uh, happens more regularly throughout the day. So that's for that reason, I would say to start with, just do it 24 hours a day and don't worry about countering your overnight pH swing. The one thing I would say about pH, so if you're really worried about it and you really want to look into it and you want to flatten the curve as much as possible, that's probably something that you should think about doing later on down the line. It's a bit more advanced than when you're starting out. But if you want to do that, the best way to, to find out is that your peak pH will be at the point at which your lights start to dim down. So if your lights are on 100% until 8 p.m. and then they start to ramp down from 8 p.m., 8 p.m. is the point that your pH will be at its highest. And 
probably a couple of hours after your lights come on in on in the morning is when your pH will be at its lowest. So that's the swing to look for. Number 18, and this is about phosphate. So one of the other things I didn't talk about in my how-to video or my long-term review, both of which I'll link in the description uh, a little bit after this video, uh, is that it does actually reduce phosphate. Amazing benefit uh, that people don't often talk about. And what I found at first is that my phosphate is always quite high in my main tank. It is 0.3, and that's 0.3 not 0.03, so probably about 10 times higher than it should be. Uh, but what I did find at first was that it reduced my um, uh, my uh, phosphate from 0.3 to about 0.2. And I wasn't using anything else that would uh, would significantly impact my phosphate. I wasn't using GFO, Roophos, all those sorts of things. I was just dosing Calcwasser. Over time, though, I found that it certainly isn't enough. It might still be doing something like that. It might be giving me some benefit, um, but actually, it doesn't, it's not going to take over completely uh, removing all the phosphate that you need to. And it's not a replacement from uh, for Roophos and GFO, which I'm as gutted about as you are, because I would love nothing more than to bin off uh, Roophos and GFO because it is messy. So just thinking of that as another very, very minuscule side benefit rather than something that will take care of all your phosphate problems. But equally, if your phosphate is quite low, you probably don't have to worry about it too much, stripping all of your phosphate out. But again, that is something to keep an eye on. And my final point that I wanted to tell you about, number 19, before I go on to the FAQs, is that you should consider buying cheap bulk Calcwasser. Now, when I started out with Calcwasser, I was using, and this video isn't sponsored, by the way, but everything I talk about myself. Uh, this video, uh, when I, sorry, when I started dosing Calcwasser, I was using fancy Seachem Calcwasser. Look at that bottle. That's a nice bottle, that is, isn't it? Uh, and to be fair, this was really good stuff focus on me camera. This was really good stuff and I really liked it. It did a really good job. Uh, and I always found that if you've, uh, if you're buying a product from a, a reputable company like Seachem, it gives you the comfort you need that you're buying the right stuff and you're not buying something that isn't suitable. That though, for half a kilo costs 30 pounds in the, here in the UK. So it's probably the equivalent in dollars US in the States. Whereas if you buy bulk Calcwasser, I now get two and a half kilos for 18 pounds. So for almost half the price, I get five times as much, which is absolutely insane. Uh, and this is from APC Pure. Just get it from eBay or there's an APC, APC, Pure, APC Pure website. And it says it is 98% uh, 98 <laughs> calcium hydroxide. So it's very pure, at least according to uh, APC. Uh, and I've been using that for months now and it's been absolutely fine. I've got nothing that's come up in my uh, my ICP test that's particularly nasty. The main thing to look for in an ICP test, in fact, whilst we're talking about that, uh, I'll show you from my uh, my ICP test the issues column. So let's go back to that. Here we go. Right. So issues, the, the things that, uh, that, that pollutants that you might end up with in some tanks because of Calcwasser, according to some people, some people say that there is can be high levels of arsenic in it. And that's the sort of thing that you think, arsenic, I don't want that in my tank. But this is after, this this ICP was a month ago, so this is after about nine or 10 months of, of dosing Calcwasser. And the only levels of pollutant, so this is the issues tab of my uh, my ICP test, the only level of pollutant, pollutants are lithium, vanadium, zinc, iron, and then phosphate and phosphorus. And I have high uh, phosphate and phosphorus, I'm okay with that. So iron, zinc, vanadium, and lithium, I don't know where that's come from, to be completely honest, but I think it's pretty unlikely that it came from the Kalkwasser. Um, maybe it did, but ultimately, uh, it's not. There's not even those levels were only in the amber, and that's a fairly typical ICP for this tank. There's always some elevated levels of something. So my, in my uh, experience, anyway, it won't add anything particularly nasty uh, to your tank, even if you use cheapo uh, Kalkwasser. Now there are various places in the US as well and in Australia and all around Europe, where you'll be able to find cheap Calcwasser. Should be a little bit careful because it's not all created equal, but just do your research. Make sure you find something that uh, lots of other people uh, can vouch for and you should be fine and you'll save an absolute fortune. I spend something like 23 pounds a month on dosing solutions, two-part dosing solutions, and just over a pound a month on Calcwasser. So it will save you an absolute fortune going for something like that over something like Seachem, not that, of course, there's anything wrong with Seachem. So those are the points. Now, we'll come on to the 
most frequently asked questions um, that I wanted to that come up with. So what I've done for this is my last two CalCluster videos, I've pulled out all of the questions that I thought were the most common and the most pertinent. And I also asked, and I also asked for questions before this video. So first up is a question from AONB Aquascaper, who says, as someone with a very simple LPS and softy tank, using only a refugium for filtration and just weekly water changes to maintain parameters, would Calquasa benefit, benefit me? And if so, how? And this was a question that came up loads from people saying, I've only got a softy and LPS tank. It's a really simple tank. Is there any point in me doing it? And the answer is, well, in my experience, I've been using it on an SPS dominated tank, of course, and I've seen big improvements in growth, uptake of calcium and alkalinity, and even colors and polyp extension. Go and check out my uh, long-term review and you'll see some real improvements and even improvements that I noticed to my eye. Uh, but will it affect uh, the same, will it have the same impact on a simple LPS and softy tank? Yeah, it will. Uh, with softy tank, if it was a softy only tank, I can't tell you, I've never kept a tank like that. But with LPS corals, they still build up coral skeletons. And what Calcplaster does is increase your pH level. And what that does is makes it is it makes it easier for corals, basically easier corals for corals to live, but easier for corals to create their calcium skeletons. So yes, it absolutely will have a, a good impact, a positive impact, make your corals grow faster and probably look healthier. Um, even on a simple tank. Calcwasser is not, the one thing I should say, Calcwasser is not a miracle cure to all of your problems. And on my water box tank, it is doing just fine and it is, it is benefiting from uh, a, a slightly uh, non-suppressed pH level, but I've still got problems. Some of my corals don't look great and it hasn't fixed everything. So it's not just going to mask everything. It won't be just like you start adding Calcwasser, suddenly all your problems go away, but it absolutely will not hurt and it absolutely will do good things for a simple tank like that. Next up we have Pelagic Swimmer who asks, have you tried adding vinegar to the feed, uh, feed water to get a better yield from the calcium hydroxide? Something I was thinking about. Now this is a reference to, there are a couple of ways of how to get more calcwasser into your tank because you're limited to your evaporation. So I lose three liters, well I use three liters of calcwasser per day uh, and that means that that's all I can put in. That's basically my maximum. So if you add vinegar to Calcwasa, your Calcwasa solution, it can hold more, it can dissolve more of the powder. So therefore you can dose more. Now, for me personally, I think that's something that you should only be thinking about doing if you're quite advanced. I don't do it on my tank. I prefer to keep things really simple. Calcwasa is just so simple mixing a bit of powder up with a bit of fresh water and adding it to your tank over 24 hours. So personally, I don't like to do that sort of thing. I think it overcomplicates it unnecessarily and it pushes the boundaries and adds another stress point. You might find that your, uh, your ratios are different from batch to batch, but personally, it's just not my cup of tea. However, that being said, I've never tried it. The other thing that I wanted to talk about with this question was increasing your evaporation. Now, one of the other ways to get more calcwasser in your tank is to blow fans across the top of your tank, which will increase evaporation and will mean that therefore you lose more fresh water so you can put more calcwasser in. Now, that's a really good uh, way of doing it, but it has a couple of negative effects. Firstly, again, I think it's overcomplicating calcwasser, which should be really simple. Uh, it will also mean that your heaters are coming on more often and in winter here in the UK, I don't need my heaters coming on any more than uh, they are already because when water evaporates, it cools the water. So that's one thing. But also it's adding another element of failure. So if your fan breaks in the middle of the night or maybe even worse when you're on holiday, suddenly you're going to be adding more calcwasser then you're, you'll be losing to uh, evaporation because you're no longer blowing uh, air across the surface of your water and therefore your evaporation goes down. So for me, that sort of thing is really overcomplicating it and it's not worth doing, but ultimately it's a matter for you and uh, a decision for you to make. Next one was from Reef Dabbler who asks, if you're not using uh, a calc stirrer, is it normal for the calc to settle as the days go on? I'm mixing 1.5 grams to a litre. So this is a theory that if you dose exactly 1.5 grams of calcwasser to a litre of water, a litre of fresh water, will it settle out at the bottom? Now, I can't tell you all of the science behind this, but what I can tell you is that in my experience, 
it absolutely will do that sometimes. And you will find times when uh, you, you have a little bit of powder settling out on the bottom. It's totally normal. It's not something to worry about. I think actually it's not exactly 1.5 grams. It might be 1.4, 1.45, something like that. But don't worry, it's absolutely nothing to worry about. Uh, and that does happen. I always have um, excess calcuasa powder at the bottom of my containers. And I prefer to add too much because if you have one liter, if you have a one liter container um, and you want to put 1.5 grams in, the better thing to do, in my opinion, is throw in three grams. That way, you know, you're definitely not underdosing it. It can't uh, can't uh, dissolve any more than 1.5 grams anyway. So you will always have the same consistency and the same strength of calcuasa. And if you waste the odd gram of calcuasa here or there, does it really matter when two and a half kilos of the stuff costs you 18 pounds? Um, so yes, it is normal. Uh, five more questions then. At OK9211 says, how would you suggest combining three-part dosing with calcuasa? Also, my pH does not raise high enough without triggering an ALK spike. Any suggestions to go above 8.2 with calcuasa? This goes back to the first thing I said. Don't worry too much. Don't sweat too much. Bumping your, your pH, really trying to push it. A pH of 8.2 in a saltwater aquarium is a really healthy level. And because uh, it, it's, you know, it's a logarithmic scale, 8.2 is much, much higher than 8 or 7.8, whatever it was before you started dosing calc. So don't worry about that at all. Um, that is a perfectly acceptable level. And don't try to push it too hard and end up spiking your out. It's just going to cause you problems. If you're really desperate, there are other ways to increase your pH, like with a CO2 scrubber. Again, I think that's overcomplicating it, but don't put... Don't push too hard with your um, with your calcuasa. And how would you combine three part dosing with calcuasa? The best way to do that for me, I see calcuasa as my primary method of supplementation. So what I do is I add calcuasa up to the point uh, at which I can, which is three liters per day, and any alkalinity and calcium calcium uptake I need to replace. After that, I replace with dosing solutions. So that's the simple way of doing it. If you're currently dosing a uh, three-part or two-part, just wean yourself off as you wean yourself onto calcuasa until you're not dosing any two-part solutions. And then as your alkalinity in, uh, consumption increases beyond the level that your calcuasa uh, can manage, which it might not ever do if you've got a, a mildly stocked LPS tank, for example, uh, at that point, you can start adding a bit of um, ulfury, for example, to, uh, to top up any remaining alkalinity and calcium. Four more questions left. And this is at Jealous7846. How often do you replace or should you replace dosing lines? Another really good question. Now, I use uh, the John Guest quarter inch tubing, which is pretty much bomb proof and I haven't replaced at all in the 10, 11 months I've been using it. But the dosing tubes within my doser, the Ecotech Versa, the, spin, the bits that actually spin around, I did, found, I did find they burst after, I don't know, six months or so. So what I, they were old dosing tubes. The doser was probably a couple of years old. So what I'm going to do now is preemptively, uh, I'm going to launch a preemptive strike and replace my dosing tubes within the actual dosing pump itself every six to 12 months. Six months is probably overcautious. So every six to 12 months. As to the dosing lines themselves, it can uh, wear away at dosing lines. So maybe sporadically once a year or something like that as well. Um, just something to keep an eye on perhaps. But if you were to do so every year, you probably that's probably not a bad thing. Next up was from Instagram, McGinty Screps. Uh, says, what's the best uh, or can you recommend a, dose, uh, a dosing pump for Calcuasa? And my answer is that I use an Ecotech Versa uh, and that's the only one I've used. So I can't tell you any others, but it's a really good one. It's not that expensive for a continuous duty dosing pump. Uh, 150 or 180 pounds, I think they are here in the UK, which is pretty good value for money considering what you're getting. And Puscheck1919 says, hi, Alex, you recommend to dose calc 24 seven or overnight only. And I've covered that mostly in the video already. Uh, and I think for most people, it's better to dose 24 seven, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, rather than just overnight. If you want to flatten your pH curve, and that's really important to you, then you can dose it overnight and it will do that. But I think that alkalinity, it's more important to keep alkalinity stable. Uh, so for most people, particularly if you're newish to the hobby, newish to corals and new to calcuasa, far easier just to start dosing 24 hours a day, 
monitor what's going on, check your pH every now and then, making sure that your alkalinity isn't going up too high. And then after six months or so, you can maybe start tweaking it if you want to, but I wouldn't worry too much about it because Calquasa 24 hours a day is going to give you a really nice boost. It's what people have been doing for years and years and years. So it will still have a really good impact on your tank. And the final question, do you find, uh, this is, sorry, Zachart Bayfield 9368, who asks, do you find that uh, adding that much calc every day affects your salinity? No, it doesn't. It shouldn't ever affect your salinity. Calquasa replaces only the fresh water that you dissolve that, sorry, that you lose to evaporation. So it shouldn't affect your salinity at all. In fact, it should keep it nice and stable in the same way your auto top-off does. So no, it doesn't. If you're dosing more than your more than the water you lose per day to evaporation, as I said at the start, that's a problem and it will in theory dilute your, uh, your, uh, your salt water and will reduce the salinity. But that's a pretty hard mistake to make, to be honest, because you would notice your sump starting to fill up. And if you followed this guide, uh, then you will be absolutely fine. No worries whatsoever. So that is everything you need to know about Calquasa. If there's something that you're thinking that I've missed, let me know in the comment section below. But I wouldn't mind betting I've either mentioned it in this video or my how-to uh, dosing Calquasa video or my long-term review. And I've covered pretty much everything you need to know. So with that being said, you can now go and get started on Calc. If you enjoyed this video, then give me a thumbs up and subscribe for more. I'll be back next Friday at four o'clock UK time as always. And make sure you give it a, a thumbs up and I'll catch you again soon. Bye guys.